You know it's not going to be clickbait now. Uh, we had a little discussion about this and we figured out some uh, thumbnails um, for this week's live streams. So this one really is uh, what the exam boards have done, uh, where they've left the information that you can make sure you know exactly what you need to be um, making sure you revise ready for that paper free. And later on I have Dr. Lemon's secret, Dr. Lemon's actual master plan of how you can tackle paper free. But today, without further ado, this is for all exam boards, okay? Um, there's some suggested videos as well, just down in the description, and there's a link for each of those. What I'm basically going to do today is I'm gonna run through some of the kind of key areas for practicals that you need to make sure you, you pay attention to. Where you can find, this is the, this is the secret, where you can find the exact stuff they ask about each individual uh, core practical, required practical, PAG, whatever it is we're talking about. Um, be sure to watch these videos that will link down in the description as well. That's all the core practicals. Now, even though that's at Excel the, and there are differences between the exam boards, I'm gonna go into a bit more detail on that when I do Dr. Lemons on Friday as well. But um, even though that is at Excel, that's still massively useful uh, details. That I'm gonna do in detail later in this video, the EMF, core practical, I'm gonna actually go and I'm gonna go ahead and talk about evaluation points. I'm gonna compare edX cells with um, OCR, with AQA's version and with Educas's version as well, because I think actually knowing the absolute, um, you know, the, the, the differences between those and why one exam board has chosen to do it one way, one exam board has chosen to do it the other way and actually evaluating those gives you a really strong understanding of that. So bear with, this is gonna be um, about half an hour live stream today and we're gonna go through lots of uh, different things. I'm gonna be back on Friday and I'm gonna be back the night before, so I'll be back on this Sunday. At the end of this, if you've got any questions, then do ask um, I will get to that at the end. I'm just gonna talk about a couple of really big ideas first. Uh, errors versus uncertainties. I don't think this has been really, really well done in these um, specifications. I don't think it's taught massively well. Um, learn these two definitions. Uncertainty is the interval within which the true value um, can be considered to lie. So you measure something you're never 100% sure about anything. All measurements have uncertainties, all results have uncertainties. And the error is the actual difference between what you've got and the real thing. So you might not know the error, but you know, that is the, it is not the real thing, it is not the true value. Your calculated value is not the true value. Therefore, that's the error. That's it's not that you made a mistake, but that is the difference between the uh, true value and the thing. So the uncertainty is an interval, whereas the error is the actual difference. And errors cause uncertainties. So when we measure something, we get an error, we're never gonna be on, right on it. And if we repeat that, it won't be exactly the same every time, so that will cause an uncertainty. So basically, if you can think about a practical like this, this is a, my patented way of understanding this, really, is if your error is larger than your uncertainty, then there are ways that you can minimize that error and get within your uncertainty. Your experiment is a success if your result falls within your uncertainty. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So you can actually work those things out, work those uncertainties out, and you can say, well, hey, we have been successful with our equipment that we have if our result lies within our uncertainty. Um, errors can be random or systematic, deal with those two things differently. You can only improve random errors by repeating and looking for anomalies, etc. Systematic has to be a method change or instrument change or a systematic change, a change to the method to give you a different result. Uh, and rem an error can cause an uncertainty. So that's the first bit. And then the other big idea about that is the idea of percentage uncertainty. And I can't stress this enough, okay? Um, you can predict uncertainties or you can use the um, scale divisions, okay? So if, if you're working before, if you're thinking how much uncertainty we're gonna have, I can think plus or minus a um, half a scale division, right? Um, or you can, if you, if you think there's a different expected error, for example, you know, if you're timing with a stopwatch, it's not gonna be half, plus or minus half a millisecond time with a stopwatch. So you can say, all right, well, actually, I think the human reaction time about 0.2 seconds is a more sensible uncertainty. Um, or if you've got repeated readings, then you can use half the scale, half the, sorry, half the range. If you've got repeated readings after you've done a set of measurements, then your uncertainty is half the range. So always be thinking about percentage uncertainties and you must use percentage uncertainties if you ever want to compound an uncertainty. So you've used an uncertainty to make a calculation, then you have to use um, the percentage uncertainty because you can't add uh, two different uh, quantities. 
um, and always be thinking about reducing percentage uncertainty. This is going to come time and time again, you'll see. So for example, um, you're going to make the resolution smaller, the scale division smaller, so pick something that can measure to a higher precision, um, or you're going to make the value the thing you're going to measure larger. Now think about percentage uncertainties time and time again as you go through paper free, the practical parts of paper free. All right, okay, so now apparatus and techniques are the same for all exam boards, okay? Now this is a little bit about CPAC, don't worry too much. But basically, all the exam boards wrote core practicals require practicals PAGs to cover these apparatus and techniques. So just make sure you are completely, this list of apparatus and techniques I'm gonna go through, it's a clue as to what the questions are they're gonna give. This is the exam board secret, okay? It's a clue as that they can only really ask about these apparatus and techniques. They can't bring in a different piece of apparatus that you've never used. If you see these bullet points, you think, yeah, I get that completely, I understand what they're gonna ask me, then you're gonna be really strong in this paper, right? So, um, first one is analog apparatus to record length, distance, temperature, pressure, etc. Right, um, and interpolate between scale markings. So, so, the one thing you have to do with that information is be able to choose an appropriate one. So, what's the appropriate thing for measuring something that's ten centimeters is different for measuring something which is ten meters. You can't use a ruler to measure accurately something ten meters and ten millimeters. Well, a ruler wouldn't be very accurate for that. So, you'd use maybe a vernier scale or a micrometer. Those are analog apparatus, you need to choose them. Now, um, you, the bit interpolate between scale markings says they could expect a question, they could give you a question giving you a scale to read, or maybe having to use your own ruler or protractor in the exam. That is interpolating between scale markings just mean picking one, what's it closest to? Is it closest to the one millimeter or the two millimeter, or on a vernier scale, closest to the 0.1 millimeter, okay? Um, so expect questions actually having to do that skill. And again, always be thinking about the percentage uncertainty. How can you reduce the scale division so your percentage uncertainty is as low as possible? Next one is digital instruments. So m multimeters, for example. Okay, so a range of different things, including time. Okay, now um, think about a multimeter, for example, can always give you three significant figures. So that's a very important thing to understand because you, that way you reduce your percentage uncertainty. All of a sudden, if you're getting three significant figures, then you're, you're only plus or minus 0 0.001, okay? Um, or 0 0.005, okay? So you, you, you're reducing the size of the scale increments to reduce the percentage uncertainty. Always be thinking about percentage uncertainty in this paper. Okay, for example, uh, you know, it's not always the case that we need to have a computer to help us. A stopwatch is appropriate for times greater than, you know, five seconds, 10 seconds, somewhere around that. But in this case, you wouldn't use the scale division as a uncertainty. Always be thinking about percentage uncertainty. Hope that stuff makes sense so far, there's more. Okay, so use methods to increase accuracy of measurements such as timing over multiple oscillations, fiducial marker, set square or plumb line. So these are examples of some ways in which you can be more uh, more accurate. So make sure that you know how to do them. So you know what, you don't just time one full swing of a pendulum, you time 10 and divide by 10 to get a time period. You know, this is a perfectly acceptable way to use a, um, a timer with that human reaction time error to uh, you know to get to get accurate, make sure you you state what you're measuring with what and how to do it accurately. Those things are parts of questions that often go missing. People often forget to add those bits in their answer. So say how are you going to do it? Okay. So and remember, there's think about those errors and uncertainties in two categories: random ones and systematic ones. And I put some of those down there. Okay. So, um, who is Dr. Lemon? That is a good question. <laughs> is this um, is this going all right? Is this useful so far? How, tell me if these these are like brand new things or no. This actually makes sense. This is what we have covered in our core practicals, in our required practicals, and we're perfectly okay. Okay, so. Um, you, when would you use a stopwatch? When would you use light gates for timing? Okay, stopwatches can be used accurately for large values of time, um, if, especially if we repeat and spot anomalies and calculate a mean, right? That's if it's random. If it's an uncertainty is random or an error is random, then we can go ahead and do those things there. Right, um, light gates are good for very small values of time, okay? And it eliminates that error due to human reaction time, not just human error. Right, you don't just state human error, it won't get you a mark. Don't just state random error, it won't get you a mark. What is the error? What's causing it? What's causing what's leading to the uncertainty there? 
Okay, and then uh, we've got use of calipers, micrometers for small distances using digit or vernier scales. So they could show you a picture of a micrometer or a vernier scale and ask you to read from it. Okay, they could ask you to compare accuracy of digital versus vernier scale, questions like this, right? Okay, yeah, Kareem, I'll put the presentation um, afterwards, okay. Uh, apparatus and techniques. So this is another one, correctly construct circuits from circuit diagrams. Okay, you're not obviously gonna have to make a circuit in the uh, exam, but uh, you know, DC circuits is basically what you have to do here, um, including diodes, basically where polarity is important. Um, they could test you on the interpretation of circuit diagrams, as you well know. They could give you circuit diagrams and ask you questions about that. They could ask you to make one. They could ask you to design one. They could give you a circuit um, diagram and ask you why wouldn't this give you as uh, accurate why wouldn't this give you as accurate uh, data as another setup, for example? There's loads of different things they could ask you about or using circuit diagrams. Okay, so they could ask you to actually design or construct one. They could ask you to, you know, come up with one in a question, you know, to describe a method or something like that. Okay, so you, so you need to use the common, the, the correct circuit uh, symbols. Almost there with the apparatus and techniques, and I've got more to chat through. So use of a signal generator and oscilloscope, including volts, volts per division and time base. So the volts per division is the y-axis, basically, and the time base is the x-axis. They could ask you, therefore, to read from one or to draw onto one, make a graph using one, in which case you might need to you know, pick your own scale. And we always make sure that, again, thinking percentage uncertainty, if you've got more than one waveform on this oscilloscope, then you're gonna go ahead and use as many waveforms as you can and divide by the number there are. When you read off a oscilloscope, you use the, um, the little gain to change the volts per division in the y-axis to make it as large as possible to reduce the percentage uncertainty. So the, so the wave form looks as large as possible on the screen to reduce the percentage uncertainty. It keeps coming back, doesn't it? Um, actually, how and when would you make different types of waves? Okay, so use a microphone and a loudspeaker perhaps to measure sound waves or create sound waves. Ripple tanks, how would you measure those? With a vibration uh, generator, with a, a signal generator, actually microwave or radio wave kits, okay? So you need to know, make sure you know the uh, methods to generate the waves and to measure the waves. Okay, so there's different ways of measuring frequency for a water wave as there is for a mechanical wave. Okay, so with, um, or uh, on a signal generator, you'd use an oscilloscope on a signal generator, you might use a stroboscope, um, you might use a stroboscope to measure a mechanical wave, the frequency of it. You might use a ruler to measure the, um, you know, wavelength of a mechanical wave, but that's harder with a sound wave, in which case you have to use a microphone to move through the sound wave to measure the points where it's in phase with the signal to then use a ruler to get a, um, a wavelength. Using laser lights, okay, now, um, you know, this is basically the diffraction grating or young slits um, interference practical, uh, this all gonna be the same on all different exam boards, okay, but know the methods of the practical really well and be able to analyze the uncertainties in them. So one thing about that is the, the your angle comes from two measurements of length. So your angle in, uh, in the equation for diffraction grating comes from two measurements of length. So talk about how you're compounding that uncertainty perhaps. So your angle has the same percentage uncertainty as the sum of the, uh, the two sides, the, the sum of the uncertainties in two sides, some of the percentage uncertainties in two sides. And also in this one, think about risk assessment. Using laser light is not always the most safe thing in the world. Uh, use IT, okay, so we, we do this loads and loads and loads in my classroom, but uh, not everyone does. So make sure that you know when you would use data loggers. Don't just bang it down as, oh, use a data logger because it's just better. That's not gonna be necessarily always the case. Um, why do we use data loggers? Because they can record continuously and they can do very short intervals of time. Okay, spreadsheets, for example, is a, is a way to model things and we can work with large quantities of data very, very quickly. Using motion tracking software is really, really good because we get small measurements of time, but it does have a parallax error. So there, there's evaluations to these. It's not always the case that new is better or digital is better. And ionizing uh, radiation, definitely think about the risk assessment for this one. Um, always think, maximize your distance from the source and minimize the time to reduce the dose that you get of the radiation. And 
for example, here's an, a, a, an accurate technique that's going to be in those guides. I'm going to point you to in a minute, um, which is you have to use a corrected count rate. And maybe they could even ask you about a calibration curve with a Geiger Muller tube. So that is all the apparatus and techniques, right? Now here comes the secret. Um, let's just ask though, is was that useful? Uh, did that ring bells? Is there all stuff in there that you're thinking, yeah, okay, actually I recognize all that stuff from the core practicals and actually there's nothing in there that wasn't in the core practicals and there's nothing in the core practicals that wasn't in there. So if you just do these, if you just do these things, then you can, um, if you learn these things, then you, if you go over these core practicals, you learn these apparatus and techniques, then you're gonna have all the knowledge that you need. It's just then a case of applying to those different things, right? So there's a link in the description to um, the really important page uh, pages in the different exam boards, right? So yeah, I mainly do Edexcel, so I'm gonna go and look at the Edexcel ones in a minute. Um, but basically, in those exam board pages, you're gonna look through all those CPAC information, and you're gonna look for the, the kind of descriptions of the practicals in there and you're going to look at the accurate techniques you're going to look at the evaluation points that they ask you so i'm going to go ahead and show you um what i mean using the uh using the edexcel pages right So this here, this is the Edexcel uh, link, basically. It takes you to this page here, which is the teacher and technician notes, student notes as well, for all of the core practicals for Edexcel. And what I'm going to show you is I'm going to talk about one that there's a chance it might come up, which is the gamma radiation one. So I'm going to pick this one up. And here we go. It's got the, the procedure. Um, this is, these are the teacher sheets first. And it's got the student sheet, the student procedure. It's got all the maths you need to be able to do. These are things, these are examples, basically, of questions that they can ask you to do. Uh, you know, relating something to Y equals MX plus C comes up loads and loads of times. This is all very, very good. This is all, it's not as, even a secret. This is all important stuff. The exam board is telling you this is stuff we're going to actually test you out on. Um, all right, and then there's these questions here. Explain why you are safer the further away you stand from a gamma source. Explain why repeating your readings will improve them. The GM tube could be attached to a data log instead of simple counter. Discuss whether using a data logger would improve your results. So there are these questions they've asked at the bottom of this um, this sheet, and these questions relate to these answers here. Okay, so now look at 2007 paper. Ba bum. Here's a question about that practical, about that core practical. Uh, this was from the same page, basically the assessment materials. You know how to find past papers, don't you? And here we go. Look, student recorded the count rate for two minutes. Describe how to determine the corrected count rate. Well. It's all in here, how to do a corrected count rate. It's in the maths you need to do. It's moving on. Why this could lead to more accurate data. It's it's all in here. It's the 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 method, um, the inverse square law idea that's, co that's coming in here. And this one, explain another modification to the experiment method which should improve the accuracy of the data. Huh. Weren't we just talking about repeating and taking averages? So my point is that they are giving you very, very distinct clues as to what exactly they are going to ask you on on the um, in the questions in the paper free. So that exists for all of the um, different exam boards. Okay, now it's not quite as clear cut in them all. If I go to the OCR one, for example, uh, open link. Um, this is loads of loads of things. Aha, but look, practical skills assessed in a written examination. So this is the OCR bit that tells you exactly what, aha, this is how we're gonna test you on in the written exam. That's useful, isn't it? Look at that, everyone. That's really, really good, isn't it? So these links are in the description. Here's the Educast one, and you probably could be interested in the AQA ones. Ha ha ha. Is this, this is no, no longer, people are, are convinced this is not clickbait now. So here we go. This is the stuff. This is the methods supplied to us by AQA for exactly how to do each of the practicals, exactly how to get accuracy. The experiment can be repeated with different, ah, oh, look at that. Okay, so there are loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of information here. The AQA one also is very, very useful. The second link there. 
because that link is a required practical handbook, but it also tells you practical skills assessment in question papers. Yes. And I know this says biology, don't panic, but this tells you what types of questions they're going to ask. These questions are set in the context of the practical work that has been carried out. So review over your core practicals and make sure that you are sure about them. This question requires an understanding of the chemistry, not the practical procedure. So this is the, the kind of analysis based on the practical. This question set in a particular context, particular readings need to be used to calculate the answer, but the specific practical setup is not important in this case. This question requires students to understand how oxygen, blah, 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 blah. The practical, uh, the, um, so it's how you measure one thing, but only some details are important. Uh, you must understand the process of yield calculation, which is part of the practical work. Okay, so, you know, the process of, of analyzing the data is going to come up in these AQA questions. Okay, calculation of gradients. Hopefully we'll finish with the, with the chemistry ones in a minute. Physics ones here. This question requires students to apply the data analyst analysis skills. So make sure that you've gone through and you see the analysis that you need to know. Okay, so this is a different situation. This is not the same practical as you've done, but this is analyzing data in a similar way to the core practicals. Right, let me know if that was helpful. I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint because I've got one more thing to go through. Um, I'll just have a quick look at the chat. Why not? Um, okay. Is it useful? How, how was that good? Yes, you do need to know, or you don't need to memorize every single practical, but I think it's a good idea to have a good, a good method memorized with all those accurate techniques, really. Yeah, definitely know the method, definitely know the way to analysis, and definitely know the evaluation points. My every core practical um, thing will go through all of the uh, different, um, the, the video that I said at the start, that's, that's linked there, will go through all of the different core practicals in Edexcel with all of the kind of typical evaluation points, which really are the answers to those questions that I was just pointing out there. But if you're Edexcel, I would definitely go to that list and I would go through those. I would probably print them all out, highlight the key bits, the answers to the questions, and then okay. Yeah, you can't memorize every single detail out of them all. Okay, now um, this is the one time that I think it's worth kind of predicting a little bit. And um, the, if they've done loads and loads and loads of stuff on SHM in your syllabus, then they're probably not going to ask the question about uh, the, you're probably not going to ask the question about um, the SHM practical. Anaconda set. Anaconda says underwhelming. So the, the, uh, <laughs> The secret was not quite as much as you were hoping for. Yeah, I, I know, Scott. I'm, I, to be honest, <laughs> you know what it is, don't you? It's, it's basically I'm trying to do color keying, but uh, I've just not got quite the setup that I really, really need to do that to do perfect for that. I'm gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do in detail in the moment now. I'm gonna do in detail the um, uh, EMF and internal resistance practical. Right. So what I want to do is I just want to show you around some of the kind of ideas that I'm thinking about. Um, in terms of evaluating them, in terms of comparing different methods, in terms of thinking very deeply about your results and everything like that. So yeah, they could ask you to write up the whole procedure. So there, there would be six markers where they'd be like, um, you know, the, just tell us exactly how to do this practical. I think that's, that's a definite possibility. But then there could also be a six marker that just says, here's some data and, you know, um, go ahead and analyze this. Uh, so yeah, well, I, I, I we, what all we did uh, in our um, school was just go through really thinking about the two papers so far and thinking to ourselves what's come up loads and just kind of making sure that we, we, we're thinking about, yeah, exactly, Kieran, yeah, there wasn't much about radiation in there. So we're thinking maybe that practical come there, maybe about safety. So, you know, we think about that. And on Friday, I'm going to definitely do the gamma practical in the same way that I do this EMF one now. Um, what I'm... <sighs> I'd love to do, I'd love to say that I'd do this and check check me out if I do. Um, it would be something like all the OCR PAGs, all the AQA PAGs this week, okay? I don't know, let me know. If, if you definitely want those things, how many people would watch that? All of the AQA PAGs in the same way as my all the Edexcel core practicals, it, would, you, um, would you sit and watch that? And uh, last, uh, last one, um, 
would you would you sit and watch the OCR bit? Okay, right. So I'm going to go through the EMF and internal resistance core practical in a bit more detail than I did in that that video last time. And then that's going to be me. I'm going to say uh, goodbye after that one. Okay, so back over to the PowerPoint. So I like never make PowerPoints. And then this week I've gone like PowerPoint crazy and the kids at my school were like, what are you doing, sir? You don't make PowerPoints. But anyway, um, so this is the EMF and internal resistance one. Basically it's in or every single exam board does this. Educast do something similar. So I'm going to compare to the Educast method. They do the same practical, but they plot resistance against one over the current um, to get a positive linear relationship with minus R being the intercept. So I'm going to compare to that. Um, so Edexcel do exactly the same as AQA do it. Uh, so that that this is like the edXL method, the AQA method. Um, OCR don't have particularly this one, but they do. They use the EMF from the max power uh, of a cell, and then they talk about combining different sources of EMF and uh, comparing series or parallel sets. So that's an interesting kind of point. And remember, all the exam boards could take this you know this question into the different methods so it's well worth knowing some different kind of methods and some interesting things so i'm going to talk about the max power bit at the end as well okay so basically this is it uh, you're basically modeling the internal resistance with a um we, we haven't really got an internal resistor is the point i'm trying to make you you've actually used a fixed resistor to actually just put up here put up here on the um uh up <laughs> you've actually put it there on the um next to the cell and you're pretending that is your internal resistance and then you're going to vary the load resistance on the uh on the variable resistor there and you're going to measure potential difference with a voltmeter in parallel you know what you're measuring it with and how you're doing it accurately i was just trying to get that in there and current with an ammeter in series and then you just manipulate your algebra to make internal resistance the gradient that's the way excel and aqa do it at least um now remember these things so we model wires ammeters of a circuit components having a negligible resistance which means that they're very small compared to the other values in the circuit that's what negligible means um it's like a double crocodile much much smaller than um so they're too small to bother considering. An ammeter has a near zero resistance that needs to be connected in series. A voltmeter has a very large resistance and needs to be connected in parallel. We'll come back to those ideas later. Neither meter should affect the current in a series loop. So the actual loop with the resistor, the two resistors, um, you know, the, I, the meters shouldn't affect that. They shouldn't change the actual current flowing through those. Okay, now we'll come back to that idea at the end the idea of a meter in theory is it doesn't affect what the the circuit is doing it just measures we need to use a fixed resistor okay of about 22 ohms to model the internal resistance because the internal resistance of a dry cell is actually very small it's you know like half an ohm something like that um so we wouldn't be able to get good accuracy with that so we're just modeling it you know other types of power supplies have bigger internal resistances so this on the left hand side is the manipulation of the um algebra to get uh, what I would consider to be the kind of normal way of doing the um, <laughs> the practical, the um, LXL and the a AQA one, right? So it comes from Ohm's law, but then you're saying the total potential difference, if you like, the EMF is like total potential difference is equal to the terminal PD, that's IR plus I little r. So this uh, moving down one step, you've got the basically the combination of that. The EMF is the sum of the two voltages, the terminal PD and the lost volts, I little r. Uh, rearrange for V, okay, gives you minus little r I plus the MF. And that looks like Y equals MX plus C. And that's a massive idea, obviously, in physics, is actually modeling things in a straight line. And then I've sketched out the little graph there. You've got I on the X axis, V on the Y axis, minus R is the gradient, and the EMF is the Y intercept, right? So we'll compare that to the other method. So the other method to get R, as the intercept okay so what it does is it gives a positive uh, gradient which is always nice it's nice to have a positive gradient right so same start but this time divide through divide through i okay gives you emf over current equals uh, load resistance plus internal resistance and they'll rearrange into y equals mx plus c you've got r on the y-axis the gradient is the EMF, one over the current is the x-axis, and the intercept is now little r. Now, what do you think is gonna be the most accurate, right? Okay, well, you're gonna measure V and you're gonna measure I, so that will be an interesting thing, I think, to consider what will be the most accurate. 
So just some other things, some other ideas, um, you know, when you're doing this practical, the uncertainty comes from the multimeters, the significant figures on the multimeter. So it's not, it's not large. However, the multimeters may fluctuate a little bit. So it might be that your, your uncertainty is actually larger than half a sc uh, scale division. You're going to calculate a gradient. And when you do that, when you calculate a gradient in paper three or any part of physics, you always do a large triangle using the line, not the point. So you don't use the points. You can show the examiner a nice, big, large triangle, as big as you can make it on your graph paper. OK. Um, and then I'm going to compare the two methods I just talked about there. And I'm going to also talk about accurate techniques for graphs. Um, you do know how to do that. So you could use most or least slope. You could use, I haven't put any error bars on, but you could put some error bars on and that should allow you to either identify anomalies. So when the line of best fit doesn't go through the um, the graph, through, through the sorry error bars, then you can say that's an anomaly. It's one way to do that. You can use most in the slope and you can interpolate them between them. So this is the first method. This is the LXL and the OCR and the sorry AQA method, the normal method. <laughs> this is the method that I'm certainly used to. And um, this is just uh, voltage against current V on the Y axis. And you get the EMF being the intercepts, so that's C, uh, 1.59 volts. Okay, that seems about right, doesn't it? A 1.5 volt cell, somewhere around that. Notice I've given three significant figures throughout. It's acceptable to use slightly lower than that in the in the volts uh, column there. Um, but although I could have probably turned the, the multimeter down, down there. But I've given my result to three significant figures because that's what I've measured to. And then um, the... Into, sorry, the gradient is 22.5. Okay, so that's little r, that's the internal resistance. Now remember I said a 22 ohm resistor and it's a little bit above that. Okay, so that seems pretty close. So our error is 0.5 of a ohm. Okay, that's our difference between our true value. That can give us a percentage difference, which is a way of talking about our accuracy. So the percentage difference is, well, what's 0.5 over 22? Reaching for the class whiz, of course. I know I don't want to start the kind of arguments about what calculator is better, but that's 2.3%, right? Okay, so moving on to the uh, the other method, <laughs> the educast method, the why on earth would you do it this way method, um, because you get a positive gradient. Okay, you can see now the intercept is 23.3. And that is where the internal resistance is. So now we are plus 1.3. 1.3 over 22 is, uh, so that's like 5.9%. So that's basically 6%. It's double the percentage difference, right? So is that interesting or not? I mean, um, that can you see from this graph as well why this one is so much further out, why this is a whole like 2 or 3% larger than that, um, larger than that. Can you, can you see from the table why that why that is? It's because we've had to process the data because what we've had to do to get resistance, we've had to use V over I to calculate resistance. And then we've processed the current that doesn't increase the uncertainty in that. So what we've actually done is we've, uh, <laughs> what we've actually done is we've, um, we've compounded the uncertainty. So R, resistance has a greater uncertainty than both V and I. And our, our final values are worked out from R, which has doubled the uncertainty or the compound uncertainty of both the uncertainty in V and I. Um, and then we've divided it by, um, we've added the percentage of uncertainty of I again. So we've actually uh, added an uncertainty that we didn't need to add. Can you also see how there's a, there's a huge gap on my graph um, between the smaller sets of data, the, the smaller numbers, and, and the final set there, the final number. And that's an issue, that's a real issue. It, I, you know, I have no data for the majority of my graph here. So my line of best fit is actually less accurate than the previous line of best fit. Now, even though you can see on this one, there are some scatter from the line of best fit, this is a uh, you know the, the the line the points do not lie directly on the line all the way it's pretty precise okay this one it's hard to tell whether how precise it is because really i'm just doing a line from you know the kind of region where they're all clumped up and the final point so this is why this method for me gives less accuracy than the previous method okay so i hope that's a useful thing for you to think about so the, you know just thinking about risks and things like this you know you can say uh yeah, you can say, um, 
the risk is very low. You know, that is assessing the risk. There's a very low EMF, there's very low occurrence, there's therefore very low power. Therefore, no risk or very, very low risk. And always don't forget to be comparing to value. So remember this for determine, deduce, that type of question. Don't forget to give a final statement. This is much, much bigger than this. Or actually, this one comes as 1.3 ohms larger than, which is a 6% error, um, difference from the manufacturer's value whereas the previous method gives only what did I say two, uh, two ish percent difference from the manufacturer's value why might that be um, and in this case don't repeat the uh, um, individual readings okay repeats could actually lead to systematic error by heating but what you should do is do more data points so you can get a more defined line of best fit um, so don't repeat individual readings use smaller intervals so that you can more precisely define your your line best fit and more easily um, spot the anomalies okay i hope that's good also they could ask you about placing the voltmeter so actually there is a difference in some ways between placing the voltmeter across the cell or across the resistor now in theory the ammeter has a zero resistance all of the wires have a zero resistance but the reality is that they do have some slight resistance as do the connections in between them so they're negligible but they're not zero so actually you'd normally find as both of these results have that your calculated internal resistance is slightly higher than the actual real thing the true thing and that is because of these extra smaller resistances you know negligible but not zero um, okay and similarly voltmeters you know they should have a massive resistance they should have an infinite resistance in theory they do but in reality they don't have an infinite resistance same with a, a ammeter i think i've said that one Okay, so the result is always always slightly higher. Now the next bit, just last little bit, then context. Um, and this, the uh, did I say the OCR one? One of the exam boards actually goes and does this as a way to define uh, determine the internal resistance. So they could ask you about this. Not that you need to know it because they they've told you you don't have to memorize it. You don't have to. But you know they could ask you to actually do that with your data. And again, the problem with this one is you have to compound the error again. So actually, you should get less accuracy again because you are plotting P against R, and you're looking for this maximum power, power against resistance, and you're looking for a maximum power at the point where um, where <laughs> the load resistance equals the internal resistance. So there's different things, you know. Like uh, for example, we can use this idea of high internal resistance to have very small um, terminal potential differences to make power supplies safe. We could also um, you know, minimize the internal resistance if we want the best efficiency, or we could even match it to the maximum, and match it to the load resistance if we want maximum power, because we want a really high powered output from our thing. Okay, that is the lot. Um, I'm just gonna cut back into um, the chat. And I'm going to just uh, sort of wrap this up now. I hope that's okay. Uh, Rico asked a good question. This is, um, yeah, don't find the gradient for one point. Yeah, uh, Rico, exactly what I mean. Um, the uh, So show the examiner that you're using a nice large triangle. Do not just use the last point. Um, otherwise, why, why would you plot a graph, basically, is the, is the point there. Um, yeah, they could ask you to des describe the graph, but not so much. Uh, you're going to have to go back for the secret code, everyone. Yeah, it's a pretty nice calculator. I got some um, I got some comments about the calculator last time comparing to this. I think this is a sweet spot. About 20 quid is as much as I want to be paying for a calculator, really. Somebody posted that they, they thought their calculator was better, and I looked it up for like 70 quid, mate. I mean, you know, you can buy a small computer for that. Uh, there are error bars in Edexcel, yep. So they're most in the slope, definitely using that. Um, I'm going to do a couple more uh, core practicals uh, later. Some people saying they would watch OCR and AQA. Right, I will. Um, I will see if I got time for that. Okay, just watch this space. Definitely going to do Friday. Definitely going to do Sunday night um, for you guys. I'll see if I've got time to whiz through all of the core practicals from OCR and AQA. Uh, cool man. Was that useful? Was that interesting? Were they things that you already knew about that practical? Were they things that you've already considered? Those are all from the exam board material. They're all things the exam boards have told us to be looking at. 
with that particular core practical. So do definitely do that. Okay, um, do definitely use those links that I've just sent to you. Uh, no, Dr. Lemon's secret, Rachel, is um, is coming on Friday. I hope you'll look forward to that. Dr. Lemon's master plan. I can't even remember what I called that one. It's the the um, the thumbnail's got an emoji. Okay, the thumbnail's got an emoji. It's really really good. It's, uh, Okay, well, um, I'm going to just say to you all then, uh, go back to the very, very beginning now and um, be sure to watch these videos. Uh, they're all linked up in the um, description. I hope that's really good. Let's get on with this. Let's get on with your revision. Uh, I've got to go pick up my baby Florence from nursery. It's been nice hanging out with you as always. And um, yeah just enjoy it guys you know you're almost there now and look forward to your awesome summer that is coming i'm so jealous of that so just uh you know this is the last little push this week really uh also uh, one thing to look back um, somebody asked for um uh, how to prepare this week what i did in the week running up to exam periods was i did like four things to get an a star four things to get a grade uh, nine i suggest you actually go back to those videos and sort of do those things again because what I was talking about a lot was I was talking about finding your own areas that you struggle with more than other people and how to prepare yourself for this so this week you know use it just like that week leading up to exams again get yourself ready to go again get yourself prepared yeah hopefully um, hopefully you've had a restful kind of long weekend and um, and now it's time to get back on it okay so definitely check out these ones all the core practicals is such a good video okay that is an awesome video where I run through these things okay people have found that really really useful the derivations one because it's not just core practicals that comes up that's that one there um, the derivations one is also really really good uh, possibly not as important as this one the laws and principles one that's the one I'm pointing to there laws and principles um, you know, because it's general and practical principles of physics, you know, all the questions on this paper are going to be based around um, the, the, the kind of general laws and principles in physics. And the paper free playlist is just going to make sure you're familiarized with exactly what types of questions are going to come up in the exam. And you're ready for them, that you can take them down, that you, you know exactly what the one's asking you to do. You, and, you, you know, you're not like sitting there thinking, oh, what does it mean by do this, do that, do the other? Over to you, get revising. Lovely to spend time with you.